Good to, good to have you guys. Um, I mentioned last week I love teaching on the doctrines of grace. I love what we're, what we're doing here, what some people call Calvinism. What we are discussing are the doctrines in the Bible that describe the great lengths to which God has gone to save sinners from eternal woe and despair. Uh, these are massive. These are, these are huge. Um, as I said last week, these doctrines don't say everything there is to say about salvation, but what these are are the mountaintops of salvation, as it were. They, they highlight the ways in which God has in particular worked in, in history and before time to save sinners. Uh, these are not easy. These, these are all an uphill climb. These are all challenging. And yet, um, things that are worth thinking about are never easy. Things, things that make you grow, things that challenge you, things that, that feed your soul and and grow you in love and affection for Christ and boldness in the, in the Christian life, th those doctrines are never ones that, that come easily. They always require a little work and um, uh, uh, mental exercise. And so these are good for us. These, these doctrines are really, really good for us, good for our souls. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. We'll do a tiny bit of review, and then we are going to discuss the doctrine of unconditional election this morning. Unconditional election and what that is, and wrestle with as much as much as time will uh, as as much as time will allow to wrestle with the nuances and questions and and all the the various things that this contains. So let's pray. Oh Lord, we are uh, um, just people. Oh Lord, we emerged in time. We were born. We had a uh, day that, in which we were born, in which we emerged onto the planet, and yet, Lord, we were preceded by billions and billions of people before us, centuries and centuries of history before us. We are just a small, just fraction of time, and yet, Lord, we know that the universe had a beginning, and before that, it's not that there wasn't nothing. There was something. There was you. You were there, and in that time, before time, in eternity past, you crafted a plan. You designed, you, you were the grand architect, you designed something, you planned something, this thing called the plan of salvation, the, the drama of redemption, and Lord, we are a part of that. And we are a part of that, Lord, no thanks to ourselves, Lord. The only thing that we had to contribute to that plan were the sins that needed to be forgiven. And your contribution is everything. And so, Lord, we sit here this morning as recipients of sovereign grace, even if we haven't grasped all that that means to be recipients of sovereign grace. We feel the weight that this is big and massive and weighty, and had you not chosen us, had you not awakened us in regeneration, had Christ you not purchased and paid for our souls in full, we would not be here this morning. We would be somewhere else doing something else, living in complete unbelief. And so, Lord, we are grateful to be here. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord. This is a tough doctrine. This is a tough truth to wrap our brains around, and I pray that we would be, we would surrender to the text. I pray that the preconceived notions that we will be tempted to bring as obstacles, roadblocks, stiff arms, pushback against this doctrine, I pray that those would yield in submission to the text, and that we would melt into conformity to what your word has to say about your sovereign choosing of us before time began. Lord, we are grateful, and we look forward to the miracle of causing us to understand what your word has to say. In Christ's mighty name, amen. All right, the five doctrines of grace. I guess I won't write them down. Um, you know what they are. What, what are they? You don't have to go in the traditional order, which is typically TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. You don't have to go in that order, nor do you have to use those exact names. But what are the doctrines of sovereign grace? What are we talking about? What's typically first on the list? If it's the T, we'll let's use the tulip. So even though I depart from that order, what does the T stand for? Total depravity, right? And when we're talking about total depravity, we mean the comprehensive um, wickedness uh, with which everyone has inherited from their father, Adam, and we are as bad as we could be. We don't always act that way, but we are, we are uh, uh, ruined um, inside and out. Every fiber and cell of our of our lives is ruined with sin. What's, uh, what's the you in, in TULIP? If we're going to use that. Unconditional election. unconditional election. What is unconditional election? Yeah, and specifically through a sovereign electing choice made by God before time began, of you in particular. All right. How about the L? What is the L? 
limited atonement, right? I, I prefer particular atonement, and we'll get to the reason why, but which says that those who Christ paid for, he paid for the elect in particular, that there is great coherence between the doctrine of election, who God chose, and who Christ paid for and bought with his blood. And we're saying those are the same people. We're saying that Christ didn't die for everybody, but nobody in particular. We're saying he died in particular for those chosen by the Father before time. What about the I? What's the I? Irresistible grace, irresistible grace which is saying what? What is irresistible grace? It's pretty loaded, but... That once your eyes are open to God's grace, that you are completely given to who it is that you belong to. Yes. Yes, your eyes are open. I like that. that. That's really good biblical language that the, the Bible itself uses. Eyes open, awakened to see something, right? And what we're arguing, what the doctrine argues, is that we did not create that awakening. It happened to us. And had God not done that, then we would have never believed and been saved. And so uh, once our eyes are open to see the beauty of Christ, well, it's irresistible. How can we resist? Why would we resist, right? Uh, and then, you know, obviously, there's various objections to that. And it's like, well, people resist all the time. And does that violate what some people call free will? Well, we'll get to that. Um, but the last one, uh, perseverance of the saints, what are, we, what are we talking about? What is that? Oh, I guess I just said it, perseverance of the saints. Sorry. Yeah, so what that's saying is, is that, you know, the work began in you. God will sovereignly work in it to cause you persevere to the end, right? That doesn't mean that you don't do anything you're just, oh, you know, I'm just on a cruise ship, and I can just lounge around, and, you know, and, and I will be taken to the destination of the shores of eternity. It's, it's not that. It's that it's a sovereign work of God to cause one to persevere through all temptation and trial and suffering, right, to cause them to uh, reach the end. So those are the doctrines of grace. And again, you can put it this way. When we're talking about the doctrines of grace, uh, these are the acts of God in salvation designed to cause ruined sinners to find their highest joy and delight in God forever. That's what this is. This is the great lengths to which God had to go to save sinners from eternal woe and despair so that they find their deepest joy and satisfaction in Him for all eternity. That's what we're talking about. So we're not just talking about, oh, well, you know, there's doctrinal camps, and they each have their equally valid, valid arguments. What we're saying is, no, we're saying this matters for our joy. This matters for our lives. This, this means something for the Great Commission. This, this affects and shapes, must shape and affect who we are as people. You can put it another way. The doctrines of grace, in a way, are the entire story of Christianity. This is the father's quest at the, son, at the cost of his son's life to replace our blindness with spiritual sight. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the doctrines of grace. So uh, we are going to talk about the doctrine of unconditional election tonight. tonight. Uh, you know what I'm saying. Um, unconditional election. And so what I want to do is I want to I begin with a, a question to get you to think. Not to answer out loud, but just to ponder and think. And the question is... Um, how did you get saved? Again, don't answer, just think about it. How did you get saved? It's an easy question. It's really easy, right? Because in one sense, you heard the gospel and you believed. You heard the good news about Jesus Christ and, oh, well, that seems to make sense. I'm a sinner. He's a savior. That's a pretty good mix, pretty good pair. I need salvation. All right, I'm in. And yet, and yet the question is, was it really so simple? Because the question is, how did you come to believe? How, how did that happen? How was it that what something previously was foolishness to you all of a sudden became the greatest news in the world? How, how did that happen? How did you come to believe? Was that your own idea? Did your faith, belief really originate from you? Or would you be willing to concede that there were other powers or influences at work in your salvation. What about this? What if there was something else that happened, maybe that you didn't perceive at the time, that enabled you to believe? Would you be open to that? What if, what if your belief in Christ was not only produced by God in the moment, but what if your belief in God, in Christ, was predestined for you? What if that was the case? And what if before time there was a book written and the title of the book was called The Book of Life of the Lamb 
who was slain. And what if there were particular names written in that book from every tribe and tongue and nation and people? And what if, what if the ultimate reason why you believe is because your name was written in that book before time began? What if? What if that were the case? Would that be shocking to you? Would that be alarming to you? What if your individual salvation in Christ was a part of some larger scheme, some larger sweeping cosmic plan where you were chosen by God to believe? Would you be open to that idea? Would you feel that there's some validity to that? There's something there. What if, put it this way, what if your infinite joy in Christ was predestined for you before time began? Because I just want you to know that's exactly all of that is true, and that is exactly what the doctrine of unconditional election is. All of that is true. That is in the text. So this morning, we're, we're really in over our heads here. This morning, we, we're going to feel like little kids scrawling with our crayons in the, in the corner. Um, we're going to feel like little ants at the foot of Mount Everest, just sort of gazing up at the towering majesty that lies before us, because we're going to labor the best we can to peer back before time when only the Trinity existed. We're going to try to peer back in time through the sacred text to get a handle on, okay, what, what transaction transpired in eternity past that explains why I believe in Christ? Because whatever that transaction is, that is the Bible's explanation for why I do believe and had that transa transaction not taken place, I would not believe. That's huge. That's massive. That, that is dealing with worship. So this morning we're going to realize that to be or not to be, that is not the question nor is it even our choice. Rather, we stand here, we stand here on the stage of, of history, swept up into this plan fashioned by God before time began. And even though we may not be able to fully explain all that that means, we wouldn't trade it for anything else in the world. So that's unconditional election. And so really my aim in, in talking about this doctrine is that, uh, that I want you to not only be convinced that election and predestination are somehow true, but I want you to see them as foundational to your joy, foundational to your joy. So let's, let's do this. Uh, let's, um, before we define, I'm going to define unconditional, actually, I'm going to say one thing, define unconditional election, and then see where we get it from the Bible, and then we're going to talk about implications. Whatever we don't have left over, we'll just, we'll leave the crumbs for next week. But, uh, you know, one comment before I define unconditional election. I, I want to explain, here's what unconditional election does. It explains, um, it, uh, it, it, uh, it provides, put it this way, election provides the missing link that makes sense out of the plan of salvation. It, at least it provides a crucial miss, missing link that explains why we have salvation. You see, if you look at John 17 especially, which we'll, if we have time, we'll take a look at that, we'll see that there was the Trinity in eternity past. The way Christ speaks, it's really clear that there was the Father and the Son before time. We assume the Spirit was there, and uh, we don't need to assume. We know that. But uh, there, there, in eternity past was the Trinity. We look at Revelation 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth, and there is the Trinity. The difference between those two bookends, however, is that in, is that in eternity future, there are nations worshiping the Trinity. Nations are there. And you see, unconditional election is one of the key crucial links that explains how those nations got there. Explains how they got there, namely because they were chosen, they were handpicked, they were singled out and selected for salvation. So here's some definitions. Some definitions. These are going to be long. You're not going to get all this. There's going to be a video. I forgot to send you the, the video last week. Uh, so you can you know, uh, read these or hear these later. Uh, but this is just to orient you. Here's different ways that this has been defined throughout history by different um, theologians. Uh, the Canons of Dort, which I really love. I commend those to you. They're written in 1619. They're hard. They, you know, kind of have some thee and thou language, which is always a little bit tough to weed through. But if uh, there was a series of uh, like one or two months where I just used this as the thing that, like before I spent time in prayer, I would just read through sections of this at a time to get my heart stoked and then be ready to pray. It fueled my prayer life. I've done that a couple times. I'm going to come back to it again. Here's how the Canons of Dort defined election. Listen carefully. So again, I'm going to define it, and then we're going to look at where the Bible, where it comes from. Election, they say, is the unchangeable purpose of God, whereby, it's all one sentence, whereby before the foundation of the world, 
Out of mere grace, God chose, according to the good pleasure of his own will, from the whole human race, which had been ordained to fall through their own sin, a certain number of persons to redemption in Christ, whom he appointed the mediator and head of the elect and foundation of salvation. All one sentence. I love that. I love long sentences. Lots of commas there. So election is the unchangeable purpose of God, whereby before the foundation of the world, out of mere grace, God chose according to the good pleasure of his own will. That's the main verb. God chose according to his, the good pleasure of his own will from the whole human race, modifying that, which had been ordained to fall through their own sin. Again, here's the object of the main verb, chose. A certain number of souls to redemption in Christ. What is it about Christ? He was appointed the mediator and head of the elect and foundation of salvation. That's a 16, 19, really great, thorough, profound way to describe unconditional election. Again, if you wanted to Google that later, you could just do Canons of Dort and you could find a PDF of it. It's really worth having, worth reading. So that's, that's theirs, I, and, and I really like that. I think that's, that's helpful. I think it's a helpful definition. It's long, it's wordy, but it's really helpful. Uh, here's another one. Again, just want, I just want you to absorb what you can here. I know you're not going to pick up everything. It's a lot. Uh, this is from Louis Burkhoff, who is one of my favorite systematic theologians. He said, election may be defined as that eternal act of God, whereby he, in his sovereign good pleasure, notice, and on account of no foreseen merit in them, chooses a certain number of people to be the recipients of special grace and of eternal salvation. More briefly, it may be said that uh, may be said to be God's eternal purpose to save some of the human race in and by Jesus Christ. So you, you hear in each of those, there is the, the human race as a whole, and yet there is a specific subset of the human race that is the recipient of God's particular choice. Right? That's, that's the issue. There, there is a distinction. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are elect and non-elect. There are those whom the Father has chosen, though, those whom He has not chosen. And those whom he has chosen are the recipients of, here he says, special grace and eternal salvation. Okay? All right, I'll read one more, and then I'll, I'll let you ask any questions that, that come up, and then we'll, we'll look at this from the Bible. Uh, here's another one. This is actually from a, a church that I'm a, a big fan of. Um, they, they worked hard to, to say this well. We believe that God's election is that which is given through his son Christ Jesus before the world began. By this act, God chose, before the foundation of the world, those who would be delivered from the bondage of sin and brought to repentance and saving faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, what I really like about that is that it really has this, the, you know, it, this emphasis on what exactly was the design of God's choice. What was the design? What was the purpose of it? Was it just, well, you know, I mean, it, it, was, not, it was not definitionless. It was very particular. That those who were chosen before the foundation of the world would be delivered from bondage to sin and brought to repentance and saving faith in Jesus Christ. So you see that even the faith with which we exercised in Christ was part of the deal of election. That God determined who it is who would believe, that's in a way that does not in any way violate or minimize our personal responsibility to believe. Not, none of that changes, but what it is is that we were chosen to believe, determined to believe, and have and receive salvation in Christ Jesus. So uh, questions on that. Again, I mean, there, there's tons of questions, innumerable questions. The list is on and on and on. One question leads to the other, of course. Um, Questions so far? Well, at this point, what, what, question, what are the question marks that arise in your mind that you feel like, okay, maybe we can't get to it now, but these are the kinds of questions that in a conversation would need to be asked? What do you think? What kinds of questions would need to be asked in hearing these kinds of things? It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair. How is this right? Exactly. 
How is this right? What else? The same point for me, you've already mentioned, just like where does free will fit in? And uh -huh. how, does that, how does that work? And isn't that part of it too? Right, right. The, the question of free will. And, and I would even add, is that even, should we even use that phrase? And it really just depends on what you mean by it, right? So it's like, okay, well, what about that? What about personal responsibility? What about accountability? I mean, how does, is any of that influenced or, or changed? What else? What else do you feel like, boy, that's a question you, you have to have in this conversation. You've got to discuss that. What, what else would be added? What about the question of, okay, well, you talked about people who God did choose. What about people who he did not choose? The, the question that sort of looms, looms, uh, uh, sort of lurks beneath the surface is, did God just leave them be as is, and then they just went their own course, or did he actively choose them to disbelieve? That's a question you have to answer. Did he, let's just put it pretty starkly, did he predestine them to hell? It's an interesting question. Whether we get to that today, we will see. This is loaded, right? I mean, what we're dealing with here is not a small, small thing. And the most important about this is that this is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. This is not invented by the canons of Dort or, or Calvin. It's like, oh, well, you know what, you know, I just... This is, you know, it's like there's, there's nothing driving this other than what the sacred text itself says. This is a biblical doctrine. Now, we, you, can, you can dicker on whether you think that, the, you know, on, on what it means to be chosen, because you can't deny that the words are there in the text, but we, we cannot deny that it is in the Bible. So let's, uh, let's, let's do, uh, and here's my definition. The most inferior out of the four that I've given, but here, here's what it is. Unconditional election means that God before time in order to display the full extent of his own glory, singled out and selected a particular number of souls from every nation to be saved, and then gave them to his son for whom he would die and purchase with his blood. I can't. Uh, unconditional election means that God, before time, and this is a key insert for me, in order to display the full extent of his glory, singled out and selected a particular number of souls from every nation to be saved, whom he gave to his son, for whom his son would die and purchase with his blood. Unconditional election means that God before time, in order to display the full extent of his glory, singled out and selected a particular number of souls from every nation to be saved, whom he gave to his son for whom he would die and purchase with his blood. That's, that's election. Again, you need like to take all of those and put it together, and then that would be like the full perfect, and they make it all one sentence too, because then that, <laughs> that's what you got to do. Okay, so let's, let's just explore this from the Bible. Let's just explore this and see this from the sacred text. Uh, let's begin in the Old Testament, believe it or not. Turn to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7. How are we doing for time here? Probably not well. well yeah. Deuteronomy 7. Uh, you guys remember that uh, Deuteronomy 7 is sort of a, a renewal of the covenant, or Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy is sort of a, a renewal of the covenant, right? It's a new generation of Israelites. The wilderness is strewn with corpses of unbelieving Jews who would not accept the promises of God, people who whined and complained and wanted to go back to Egypt. Well, fine, if that's how you feel, then you, you don't get in. So uh, their unbelief uh, killed off uh, a generation of Israelites. Here is a new generation of Israelites about ready on the, you know, I mean, they're standing on the barbed wire fence of Canaan. They can see the land. Here it is. And before they go in, Moses is like, all right, I got one thing to say to you. And what I want to say to you is everything that I said to the first generation, here it is. And included in that are some, some really helpful reminders uh, to the Jewish people before they entered into the land. One of which is, don't you dare think that because you're getting the land that you're somehow better than the people that you're going to remove. Don't you dare. Don't you dare think that. Deuteronomy 7. Verse 6. Someone go ahead and read it. So you are a good people if I wish to go to this land. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his special possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Okay. So this is really interesting. He, you know, 
you are a holy people, which doesn't mean they were a pure people, although that would be the intention that they would become that. It's that they were a unique people, a distinct people, a set-apart people, a, a people who are different than others. This is a people who are singled out and selected for a particular purpose. You are a holy people to Yahweh your God. Notice what he says, Yahweh your God, Bacher, chose you, chose you. And he chose the Aztecs, and he chose the Greeks, and he chose the Mayans, and he chose whoever. Is that what it says? He chose you out of all the nations, peoples who were on the face of the earth. One nation chosen by God, Israel. One. One. Think about the implications of that. Think about that. That means whatever people groups there were in Papua New Guinea, not chosen by Yahweh. Not chosen. Not. Whatever, whatever people groups, whatever they were in, in ancient Japan in, the, in those days, not chosen. Not chosen. Native Americans, wherever they were at that time, not chosen. Greeks, Egyptians, not chosen. That, that's, those are the implications, right? Not chosen, not singled out by Yahweh, not a special people to him, not a treasured possession to him. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, that they couldn't gain access to the salvation that, that Yahweh offered in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that. It means not chosen. That's big, right? See, see oftentimes people who are uncomfortable with unconditional election in the New Testament fail to see things like this and be like, oh, well, wait a second, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. One nation out of the entire planet holy to Yahweh. You can see the same thing in Deuteronomy 14 and other places. Uh, how about this? Uh, turn to Amos. I know you just woke up this morning. I was like, I really hope Jared takes us to the book of Amos today. <laughs> really like the book of Amos. Uh, Amos chapter 3, uh, verse 2. Amos 3, verse 2. Amos is in what some people call the crispy section of the Bible. <laughs> It is, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, I, I had this dream, not like an actual dream, literal dream, but this really, this passion to like teach theology seminars just on the minor prophets. It's like, that would be awesome. One of these days I will. One of these days I'll preach on the minor prophets. Uh, Amos chapter three, verse two. Someone go ahead. Still talking about Israel, obviously. interesting connection. You, I only I have known, therefore I will punish you. That's interesting. But notice, you only have I known. Does God mean, I didn't know there were other people on the planet. Whoa! I, did. I only thought there was you. Obviously, not the case, right? That's a special knowing, isn't it? I know my wife in a way that I do not know you. I relate to her and connect to her in ways that I do not know you. She is set apart. She is singled out and selected, right? So I love all of you. I love all the women in this church, but there is one woman in particular that has captured my affections. There's one. And this is the exact same thing that, that Yahweh says here. You only I have known. Some versions even uh, understand this so closely to choosing that some English versions say, you only I have chosen. Literally, it is known, though. Okay, so there's that. There, there's that. There's this precedent set in the Old Testament. You could also look at Psalm 33, 12. You know, blessed is the nation whom Yahweh chooses. That's interesting. And so there's a precedent set in the Old Testament. Now, uh, let's see this in the New. This is, this is really big. And, and um, previously in the past when I've taught this, I did more of a, a systematic theological approach, meaning... Um, I just sort of stood back, gave you theological points, and gave you theological proof texts. You know, election is eternal. Look at this verse. Election is unconditional. Look at that verse. But what I want to do now, and I've never taught election this way except in sermons, is just look at a text to, to see election as organically connected to, to the context. And I think that'll, that'll help us. And often what I've found is that when you deal with election in this way, it silences objections. It's like, oh, well, I can't, I can't. I can't deny that that's there, and that is what the text says. So uh, start in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We'll see what we've got time for. I'll do my best to unfold this. John chapter 6, starting in verse 35. The, the scene here is nothing short of tense and electric. 
If you remember John chapter 6, the day before Christ uh, fed about, you know, we call it the feeding of the 5,000, more like 10 to 12,000. I mean, it was really a, a big deal. Uh, only the men were counted, not because men only mattered. It's like after a while, it's like, ah, I lost track. I don't, you know what, I, for sure, I know there's, there's, there's this many men here, and there's wives here, there's some kids, I don't know what's going on, 10 to 12,000 people. This is really a big deal. Uh, so that happened the day before, and the next day, uh, they have this same crowd who had a free lunch the day before has an altercation with Christ in the middle of a synagogue. So this is a synagogue. This is not a field. This is in a synagogue, a house of Jewish worship. And he's preaching to them, and, and they're not super crazy about what he's selling. They're not, they're not happy about this because he keeps making these elevated statements about his, about his identity and deity. They're just there for the continental breakfast. Seriously, they're not there because they're actually interested in him. They just want a free meal. I'm not even kidding. He calls them on it in the, in the text. You're here not because you saw miracles, but because you had lunch yesterday. He says that. The word lunch is not in the text, but it's, it's because you ate bread and were made full. So verse 35, he, he articulates the purpose of that miracle. What's the purpose of you doing the feeding of the 10,000, 12,000 Christ? Verse 35, I am the bread of life. I am the bread. What you ate yesterday, your appetite being filled yesterday, was nothing more than an object lesson of who I am. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. That's the point right there. Verse 35, that's the point of the whole miracle the day before. Now, notice what transpires in verse 36. But I said to you, oh, and then... Uh, um, you know, but then he says, but I said to you uh, and you, that you have seen me and you do not believe. That they don't believe. They believe in the sense that they believe, you know, that he could make them food, but that was the extent of their belief. It was very shallow, very, very, you know, um, uh, uh, what's that called? Ex exploit, exploitation kind of faith. They just wanted to use him and exploit him for what he could do for them. Do us a little dance. You know, you know, conjure up food so we can eat. And so, but, but again, notice, uh, you have both seen, but you don't believe. You don't, you don't believe. And you would think, it's like, well, okay, the ministry of Christ is a failure, right? Because he, he's doing these miracles. No one is believing. This gr crowd is growing increasingly hostile. By the end of the chapter, the, the crowd leaves. You remember that, right? The crowd leaves. I'm not going to listen to this guy. I'm not going to listen to this. I'm out. Yeah, me too. I mean, and seriously, I don't know how many people were in the synagogue. He clears the room of people who, who said they believe. They don't believe, and he calls him on it. Is this a failure? Is this a failure of his ministry? Verse 37 provides the key qualification insight that indicates for us that his ministry was not a failure because what we find out, what we find out is that, um, is that uh, the, their leaving, forsaking him, was not evidence of the failure of God's plan, but the fulfillment of God's plan. Their walking out and rejecting him was indicative of the sovereign work of God. Look at verse 37. He clarifies. You don't believe. Well, what does that change? Verse 37, everyone whom the Father gives to me will come to me, and those who come to me, I will in no way cast out. I read Greek and got a baby toy all at the same time. Let me think of that. Multitask, right? Everyone who, everyone, notice the language. Everyone whom the Father gives to me will come to me, and those who come to me, I will not cast out. This is really interesting. This is really interesting. And so what, what, what we see here in verse 37 is some kind of interaction, some kind of transaction that took place between he and the Father. I want you to notice four things. One, there is the giver of the gift. In verses 37 through 40, there, there, there's a couple things you need to know about. There's the giver of the gift. There is the recipient of the gift. There is the gift itself. And then there's the final outcome of the gift. So uh, notice, notice, uh, verse 37, who is the giver of the gift? Let's look at the verbs. Christ is talking about something and some exchange and, and, and someone has given a gift. Who's the giver of the gift? 
the Father is the giver of the gift. That's really clear. Everything that the Father gives to me. Verse 39, everything which the Father has given to me. Okay, well, when was this gift exchanged? We don't know. No, no, no. We, we, it becomes real clear soon. But then we get to the recipient of the gift. Who is the recipient of the gift? Look at the, look at the text. Who's the recipient of the gift? It's Christ, right? He is the recipient of the gift, everything that the Father has given to me. Okay, now, now we have to get to the gift itself. What is the gift? What is the gift? Well, notice about the gift it, from the Father to the Son, you have to know that it's people. It has to be souls, right? It has to be because, because, notice, notice, the gift comes to Christ, verse 37. The gift is not rejected by Christ, verse 37. The gift is not lost by Christ, verse 39. The gift is resurrected by Christ, verse 39. The gift beholds Christ and believes in Christ and receives eternal life from Christ, verse 40. So clearly, the gift is people. The gift is people. And so that's really interesting. And so then there's the outcome of the gift. What, what happens to these people given from the Father to the Son? What, what's the outcome of this gift being given by the Father? Well, uh, the outcome is this. These souls uh, given to the Son by the Father, they come to Christ. So just a repeat of the whole last point. They come to Christ, verse 37. What's that? Yeah, uh-huh, exactly. They are not rejected by Christ, verse 37. They are not lost and they do not perish, verse 39. These souls are resurrected by Christ in the last day. They behold Christ, they believe in Him, and they receive eternal life from Him, verse 40. These people believe and get saved. Think about the implications of this. Not everyone comes to Christ, but these people do. Not everyone believes in Christ, but these people do. These, this gift, this gift exchange, not, not everyone, uh, some people Get, some people are lost and they perish. Not these people. These people get resurrected by Christ in the last day. These behold Christ and believe in Him and receive eternal life from Him. Not everyone receives eternal life. So again, put this, put this together. These people were given by the Father to the Son. These people, in particular, these people who come to Christ and believe in Christ and love Christ and, and come to Him and uh, receive eternal life from Him and are raised up from Him and behold His glory forever and ever and ever. Those people are the ones given by the Father to the Son. Given by the Father to the Son. These and not others. These. These alone. And nobody else. These alone get saved. That's staggering. And that explains why the ministry of Christ is not a failure. Right? Because people, Christ could walk a whole, watch a whole room walk out and reject Him and this is not exactly how it played out because he was never flippant with people's souls, but in one sense he could go, not chosen, not part of the gift. My, my ministry is not a failure because, because you left because you are not included in the love gift given by the Father to me before time. That's, that's astonishing. It's astonishing. So what we have to be clear is what we see in the text is a differentiation between humanity as a whole and this particular subgroup of people in particular called the love gift. And I think it's really interesting, don't you, that uh, Christ takes one of the most controversial doctrines found in the pages of Scripture and refers to it as a gift exchanged between the Father and the Son before time began. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Election. He didn't say the word election. He said gift. If you belong to Christ, just, just, just think about this here. If you belong to Christ, you are part of a Trinitarian gift exchange that happened before time. That your name came up in a conversation between the Father and the Son in eternity past. Just, just ponder that for a second. You weren't there. You had nothing to do with it. Just unilaterally, sovereignly, unconditionally, I don't know what that conversation sounded like. I would love to have a recording of that. It's a conversation between the Father and the Son. I choose Rachel. I choose her. 
and my son, I give you to her. You're going to die for her. That sounds, that sounds great. I will. I will, Father. I choose Troy. I choose Troy Sargent. And I give him to you, my son. And he's going to come to you, and he's going to believe in you, and you're going to raise him up on the last day, and you're going to die for him. That sounds great. Gift, part of the gift. It's astonishing. It's astonishing. So, so we have to, the, the election is, is there in the text. It's everywhere in the text. And you could see it too in John chapter 10. You could see it in John chapter 10, verses uh, 25 through 30. How are we doing here? Can we do this here? Eh, we'll see. Uh, so look at uh, John 10. John 10. And we'll just do this real quick. It's, it, there's actually some overlap here. Uh, John 10, uh, the context is actually a continuation of the scene uh, all the way from chapter 7. So 7 through 10 is actually a unit. And it's this series of feasts that are going on. And chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, Christ faces pretty much nothing but hostility and just hatred and animosity from th these group of people. Um, and what's really interesting is that in chapter 10, they kind of surround them like a bunch of bullies in the schoolyard. They kind of just like, you remember seeing fights, you know, in, in elementary school and junior high, and there'd be like the big circle, and there'd be the two people square off, only it's a circle, and then there's, the, there's a crowd of people uh, confronting Christ. And their question is, it, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, they come to him, it's like, okay, all right, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? Literally, the Greek says, how long will you lift up our souls? It's interesting. And, and the question is, uh, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And his response is, I already told you. I already told you that I am. I mean, how many, how many ways do I got to tell you and show you? But then I want you to notice something. I want you to notice what he says. Am I missing a page here? Um, I want you to notice what he says in <laughs> verse 25. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, verse 24. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Tell us boldly, verse 24. Verse 25. I already told you, and you do not believe, because um, you do not believe the works which I do in the name of my Father, uh, these testify concerning me. Here it is, verse 26. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Okay, now think about that for a second. Think about what he just said. You do not believe. I showed you these miracles, which are just undeniable. But you don't believe because you are not my sheep. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, you are not my sheep because you don't believe. Does he? Does he say that? You do not believe because you are not my sheep. What is he saying? What, what, what is... Believing in him is dependent upon what? Being a sheep. Well, that's really interesting. So the question we have to ask is, well, who are the sheep? Who, who, who are the sheep? Okay, if being a sheep is what's nece nece necessitated, necessitated to, being, to, to believing, you have to be a sheep before you believe, <laughs> wow, well, well, who are the sheep? Who are the sheep? What are we talking about? Notice verse 27 through 29. Christ says exactly who the sheep are. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish forever, and no one will seize them, snatch them out of my hand. The Father, notice the language, who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one will seize them, sneeze them, seize them, snatch them out of the hand of my Father. I and the Father are one. What, who are the sheep? Tell me. Tell me about them. And actually, what we learn from verse 15 is that they are scattered through the nations. That's interesting. Um, and verse 15 it, it, the sheep are those, notice verse 15, look what it says. Christ says, what does he do for the sheep? What does he do? Dies for them. He dies for who? 
For who? The sheep. Notice, for the sheep. For the sheep. In particular, specifically, I die for the sheep. Okay, but notice. Notice verse 27. Uh, my sheep hear my voice. Okay? Not everyone hears the voice of Christ. And hearing in the sense of like, you know what, I hear what you're saying. I'm in. Not everyone hears in that way. He says he knows them and they follow me. Not everyone follows Christ, but the sheep do. The sheep do. And I give eternal life to them. Not everyone has eternal life, but the sheep do. Sheep have that. They will never perish. Some perish. Okay? No one will snatch them out of my hand. The Father who has given them to me, given them to me. So what we're seeing here is this is exactly what Christ is describing in John chapter 6, right? These sheep are the love gift given by the Father to the Son for whom he would die and purchase with his blood. This is a subset of humanity in particular. And it doesn't include everyone. It just doesn't include everyone. And, and the objection is, it's like, well, how is this fair? How is, how is this right? And, and again, this is a, a question that, that, that expands beyond the realm of a, of a two-minute window that I have to answer the question. But the Father, the answer is the Father can righteously discriminate. The discrimination is the naughtiest word in the 21st century right now. It's the naughtiest word. It's not a naughty word. You discriminate all the time. The Father discriminated, righteous discrimination in eternity past, choosing some, not others. My son, I'm, I've chosen some, and we're going to call them sheep, and I've chosen them, and I've singled them out, and I've selected them, and I, and I give them to you, and you will lay down your life for them, and they will hear your voice, and they will follow you, and you will give eternal life to them, and you will raise them up on the last day, and no one will snatch them out of your hands. It's really interesting. And which is, by the way, the ultimate understatement of the universe. Election is interesting. It means everything. It means everything. Uh, so let's fill in some blanks here. And then we'll end with this, and then maybe we'll do, we'll do some implications. Actually, no. Uh, I'll just give you implications now, if, if I may. Uh, here's, here's some uh, implications of, of unconditional election. If you guys want, we could deal with objections or questions next week. We could totally do that. So I didn't mean to make this only a monologue, but I feel like it was just, we just had to take the time to look at the text to see what the text actually says. We've neglected dozens and dozens and dozens of biblical texts that actually talk about this doctrine. We have, because they're there. They're there. But here's some, here's some implications of election. Number one, the, well, I'll just, I'll just, let me just ask you. When you hear this kind of thing, about election, this sovereign choosing of God of particular souls before time to be saved, what, what, what sort of implications do you feel like that has? R really shaping implications that should shape and influence the way that you think, either about you or your own salvation or lost people. What do you feel like are the implications that naturally land on you as you hear about this doctrine? What would you say? What does this matter for us? which is a deep one. It's big, right? What do you think? Yeah. 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 Precisely. I would have already. Yeah. Right? We would have blown it. Maybe even in hell, even as we speak, right? You're, you're, I think I think that's really that's exactly right. I mean, think about humility. How do you, look, I'm a proud person. Speaking about me, Jared, I'm I'm a really proud and arrogant person. You would not believe the thoughts that go through my head, and and this cultivates humility. This cultivates humility. This makes you at the end of the day go, oh wow, uh, you know, my whole life was ordained. My faith in Christ was was not. Like, because I, I, I'm just, I'm so insightful and I got it and other dopey people didn't. It's the, it's like, no, this, I was chosen. Abs you know, and, and, then, and then out of that, what should, what should be the effect of that? Uh, I was chosen. I was singled out and selected. If humility is not going to be, if pride is not going to be the response to that, which it shouldn't, what should be the response to that? I was chosen. 
I was part of the conversation between the father and son before time began. What does that produce? <laughs> they would, at the very least, right? It's like, what did you do to get your name in the book? Uh, see, there's nothing. There's nothing, right? That's why it's unconditional election. What else? What else does, does this produce? Right, absolutely, absolutely, that's exactly what it does. And, and you know, and I think that's my implication number nine. I've got nine implications of election here, and, and one, of which, one of which is, rather than kill the need to pray, preach, or plead with sinners to repent, election is actually the very thing that guarantees that our prayers, preaching, and pleading will not fail, right? It just guarantees, right? So, you know, election doesn't remove the responsibility to share the gospel, it actually gives us encouragement that our, our evangelism cannot possibly fail. The, the, the elect are going to be chosen. And in one sense, does it, does it matter to us, in a sense, who the elect are? Not really. I mean, in one sense, sure, it, it really does matter. Because what it does is like, okay, you know what, I know that if there's a crowd of unbelievers, the elect are among them. The elect live on my street. The elect might even be this lady next door, right next door, who lives next door to me, and she comes over every week, and we talk about the Gospel of John. It's just she needed counseling. Mm, well, let's talk about the Gospel of John. I don't know if she's elect. And, and so in one sense it matters, in another sense it doesn't matter because we don't know who they are, so we preach and we proclaim and we pray knowing that it, it is in the sovereign hands of God. All right? So all sorts of, all sorts of things. One... Uh, you know, uh, one implication is that the election that God chose you before time should lead to an overpowering sense that your, your life is not your own. Your life is not your own. We, we exist for the glory of another, don't we? We exist for the imperial majesty of Jesus Christ and for the glory of his invincible sovereign empire. And, and unconditional election is perhaps the most dramatic reminder that we belong to another. Number two. Election is one of the greatest evidences uh, of God's love for you and that your salvation is eternally intentional. Th that's what it is. Election is one of the most dramatic reminders of God's love for you and that his salvation is eternally intentional. I mean, you think about it, you know, salvation was not, I always think of this, you know, I always think of like someone like, you know, those artistic type people, they're kind of chaotic and they don't have their life together and they're just getting inspired and they're at a cafe and they grab a napkin. It's like, oh, song lyrics or poetry lyrics. And they're just writing on the napkin or the back of the receipt. Oh, you know, and they're just sort of like those kind of crazy people and their lives are sort of messy. I, I really enjoy those people. They're really fun. Um, the plan of salvation was not that. It was not five minutes beforehand. Oh, oh, uh, I got an idea. You know, Trinity, you know, writing out, here's this plan on the back of a napkin. Let's do this thing. You know, and it's not that. Eternally intentional. Number three, now, the doctrine of election is our deepest security that those whom God chose not only get saved, but they stay saved. Do you see the end? Like, I don't know who said it, but the, but the end, the finish line, is part of the deal, right? No one will seize them out of my hand. My Father, who is greater than all, no one will seize them out of the Father's hand, right? I will raise them up at the last day. Now, that, that doesn't mitigate your responsibility to fight sin and 
pursue Christ and not, you know, it doesn't mean, well, I don't have to do anything. I can just coast. It's not it, not it at all. Um, but we will stay saved. Number four, election is one of the most profound roots and causes of humility, like, like Adam talked about. Man, if you want to be humble, think about this doctrine. An, an arrogant, someone who becomes arrogant and conceited and mean-spirited using the doctrine of election to do so just makes zero sense, doesn't it? It just makes zero sense. It's like if you're one of those people, you know, and that's why some people react not against Calvinism, but against Calvinists, you know, just people who they make some good connections in the Bible, but it has the wrong effect because they haven't really thought through the implications of what it means. And, and so because they come to this intellectual, you know, awakening of what the Bible says, it turns them into these monsters until they go through some trials <laughs> and uh, it kind of humbles them. Uh, but uh, election is uh, one of the roots and causes of humility. Number five, election reminds us, and this is really key, that your salvation is not some commodity that you get as a reward for faith in Christ, but election reminds us that salvation is ultimately the enjoyment of God himself. That's, that's what our salvation is. I mean, you understand, Trinity in eternity past, Trinity in eternity future. The difference is, is that nations are there worshiping the Trinity. Do, do you realize that your salvation, what salvation ultimately is, is you enjoying you being caught in the crossfire of the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father for all eternity. Do you know that's what your salvation is? Did you get to be share in the life of the Trinity? That's what it is. That's salvation. Caught in the crossfire of Trinitarian love and affection forever. Number six, how am I doing? Oh, snap. Uh, doctrine of election is one of the greatest catalysts for authentic heart felt worship because it reminds us that had God not chosen you, you would have never believed and been saved. You just gotta, you, you gotta that, has, that thought has to go through our minds at least once a day. Had God not chosen me, I would not believe. That changes, if, if that becomes part of your framework for how you understand the world, that changes how you live life. Um, another one, um, you know, the doctrine of election is one of the greatest sources of hope for sinners in despair who feel that they are too wicked for God to have chosen them. Like, like, I mean, maybe you've done it, and I've heard other people do it. They kind of blackmail God. It's like, well, I'm just too wicked. I'm just too wicked. God, God could never have chosen me. What are you saying? That doesn't make any sense. Don't, don't, you don't get to tell God who he, who he could have and could not have chosen. That, that, that is meaningless in the discussion. That's why it's unconditional. That's why it's so glorious. All right, and so um, that's, just, that's just so powerful. We have no right or power to declare ourselves beyond God's election. That is His choice. It doesn't change our responsibility to repent and believe, but that that's, is, is stabilizing for us. Number eight, uh, the doctrine of election has profound implications for global missions. Profound implications for global missions. I mean, this is the, this is the foundation of missions, the foundation. You can't do or love missions unless you really embrace this. This means everything. My sheep are out there. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. I lay my life down for the sheep. They will hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. I mean, put that in your back pocket when you get on the plane. That's the foundation for missions. Okay? So that's, that's a ton. That's a ton in, in you know, 45 minutes of time talking about something that's weighty. Uh, if, if you have questions, uh, write those down, and, and then we'll, you know, we can talk about those next week. But next week, we will be discussing uh, the doctrine of total depravity. Total depravity. Okay? All right. Thanks, guys. This is so fun. Appreciate it.